Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Kenneth J. Singleton, the president of the American Finance Association. Let me begin by telling you three things that you might not know about Ken. First, Ken and his wife Fumi adopt and enjoy rescue dogs. Here's a picture of Ken with one of his dogs on Stanford's campus. Second, Ken is an avid and excellent skier. And third, Ken and Fumi use their time, resources, and skills to found and run 1,000 Grains, which is a nonprofit that helps immigrant families establish healthy lifestyles and financial security. Here's a picture of Ken teaching some of the participants in 1,000 Grains. Ken is about to start a household finance class to be taught to middle schoolers all the way up through adults to help the participants develop financial security. Now, let me give you a very brief uh, introduction to Ken professionally. Ken is the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management at Stanford University. He served a stint as the Senior Associate Dean. He also served notably as the Executive Editor of the Journal of Finance. Ken is currently the president of the American Finance Association, and he has served the AFA in many additional service roles. And Ken's research has won numerous research prizes, including the Smith Breeden Prize at the Journal of Finance, the Frisch Medal at Econometrica, and the Stephen Ross Prize in Financial Economics. In terms of his research, Ken Singleton is one of the very top scholars in the in the profession of finance. And there are at least three major themes in his extensive list of important contributions. First, Ken has published many important papers on the modeling and estimation of term structure of interest rates. These papers incorporate a broad variety of different types of frameworks ranging from affine term structure models to macro finance models and cover both discrete time and continuous time paradigms. His early work in this area focused on the development and testing of no arbitrage affine term structure models. Ken then extended this field to consider the implications of no arbitrage restrictions for these types of models, given what is actually observable in financial markets. His latest work continues this theme by incorporating observable macro factors, such as output and inflation risks. The second area where Ken has made major contributions is in the modeling of default risk and estimation of credit risk models. His work has addressed the corporate bond markets, sovereign debt markets, interest rate swap markets, among others. Among his major contributions was being among the first to develop a reduced form approach to modeling default risk. Here Ken has several notable contributions, including a paper with Daryl Duffy, modeling term structure models of defaultable bonds, and a paper joint with Francis Longstaff, June Pond, and Lasse Peterson, How Sovereign is Sovereign Credit Risk. Ken and Daryl also have co-authored a very influential book, Credit Risk, Pricing, Measurement, and Management. A third major area includes Ken's extensive work on the specification and rigorous econometric testing of general asset pricing models. His work has been pioneering in terms of explicitly considering the restrictions imposed by asset pricing models on the joint distribution of asset returns and consumption. Similarly, some of his more recent work has shown that we can improve upon our ability to distinguish between various asset pricing models by characterizing and testing their applied restrictions on the conditional moments of st stochastic discount factor and asset returns. Here Ken again has several well, very well-known papers and, and influential papers. One paper by La uh, joint with Lars Hansen in Econometrica is generalized instrumental vari variables estimation of nonlinear rational expectation models. Another paper with Lars Hansen, this one in the JPE, Stochastic Consumption, Risk Aversion, and the Temporal Behavior of Asset Returns. 
and more recently, a paper joint with Stefan Nagel in the Journal of Finance, Estimation and Evaluation of Conditional Asset Pricing Models. And now, like you, I look forward to learning about Ken's latest research in his AFA presidential address. Thank you, John, for that very kind introduction. It's, it's truly a pleasure to be here today with you, and thank you for joining under these extraordinary difficult circumstances. I hope everybody is safe and healthy and appreciate, again, your being here today to watch my presentation. I'm going to talk today about the question, how much rationality is there in bond market expectations? And this work builds upon my research over the last several decades. I'd like to give some special thanks today to Marco Giacoletti and Albert Marcet, with whom I've had extensive conversations and collaborations about these issues, and their input was extremely helpful in preparing my thoughts for today's presentation. And I'm truly honored to be here uh, after all these years in the profession, and I'd like to also give a special shout out and thanks, of course, to, to my wife, Fumi, for all of her encouragement and support over the many decades of my doing work. Uh, for the finance profession. So, how much rationality is there in bond market expectations? Well, in this paper, I'm going to reflect on two broad questions related to the nature of beliefs in bond markets. First, how should we assess the rationality of belief formation? And second, how do we learn empirically from professional surveys? Now, Another way to put this is, what does theory tell us about how we should go about assessing uh, the rationality of belief formation? And how can we bring data on the surveys of professional forecasters to shed light on the belief formation uh, in our models? And this exploratory journey is going to be premised on two observations. First, from a theoretical perspective, we know that the dispersion of beliefs is a priced risk in asset markets. That is, the existence or presence of disagreement is, is itself a priced risk, a source of variation in the market prices of risk and in determination of the asset prices themselves. And second, empirically, we know that yield disagreement based on the surveys of professionals is informative about bond market risk premiums. My recent work with Giacoletti and Larson is one example of that. Others have found the same results. I'm going to talk about my joint work as GLS throughout today's talk. So let me just say at the outset that when I talk about rationality, I do not mean the classical rational expectations hypothesis. Rather, the question I have in mind is whether or not market participants and survey professionals are behaving optimally in the terms, in the sense of calculating efficient or optimal forecast given the informational constraints they face and their underlying beliefs. Okay, so we'll see as this develops what I mean by that more precisely. So I'm going to refine those broad questions down to sort of two specific issues for most of today's talk. So what drives disagreement, yield disagreement in particular, among market forecasters? Now there's a large class of models that looks at this question in the bond market. It builds upon the work of David and Zhang and Yan in which agents are optimally filtering for unknown inflation or output or some other state variable in our model while agreeing to disagree about the dynamics of inflation output fundamentals that are determining the prices of bonds. <clears throat> this gives rise to speculative trading that affects risk premiums in bond markets, indeed affects equilibrium prices. Now disagreement about inflation or output growth in these models is exactly what drives disagreement about bond yields. So this is going to lead me to ask the first question is, is yield disagreement then in fact aligned with professional disagreement that we see uh, in the data? That is, the disagreement in yields, is it associated with corresponding disagreement about the macro fundamentals? And secondly, 
how should we match the professional forecasters to the theoretical agent constructs in our equilibrium models? I have data on about 200 professional forecasters. Our theoretical models typically have two classes of agents. So how do we take this large number of professional forecasters and channel that information into uh, a theoretical setting to evaluate our models of belief formation and indeed asset price determination? here today in the context of the bond market. So the second question I'm going to look at is what we can learn from the serial dependence of professional forecast errors. A lot of the recent empirical work on disagreement in the bond markets has been building off the, the insightful work of Koibian and Gordodinchenko in a series of papers where they explore a reduced form noisy signal filtering problem for agents in the market. That is, they have a noisy signal about some critical state variable in the model, and then from that, they look to see whether or not the forecast errors uh, are serially correlated. And quoting from them, what they argue is that the predictability of the average ex post forecast errors across agents is an emergent property of aggregation across individuals, not a property of individual forecasters. That is what they're arguing is because individuals are forming their forecasts optimally, their forecast errors will be serially uncorrelated. But when we average across all agents in a noisy signal framework, what will emerge is serially correlated forecast errors at the aggregate level. Now, a common finding, though, empirically, is that the forecast errors at the individual level are indeed serially correlated. And this has led many to ask, is there non-rational or suboptimal behavior out there? And many have gone on to seek uh, non-rational, some would say behavioral interpretations of the evidence for serial dependence. <clears throat> But to leave, if we think about the theory that I mentioned a minute ago, indeed even more broadly, belief dispersion has the implication that the optimal forecasts of individuals will almost always be serially correlated in our models. And the simple reason for that is that no agent in a model has beliefs that correspond to that of the equilibrium data generating process for in our, my case, bond prices or yields. And so their beliefs will necessarily differ from those that are part of the GDP. And so an econometrician studying their forecast errors will naturally find serially correlated errors. In fact, that's true even in the noisy signal filtering problem of, of C and G. So their premise that I just quoted a minute ago, I think is actually uh, incorrect. Rather, it's the it's the serial dependence of the forecast errors at the individual level <clears throat> that is being inherited by the average across all of the agents, and that's why it appears at the aggregate average level. So I'm going to be going into my presentation today, and I developed this more in my paper, with the premise that when there's belief dispersion, we should almost always expect forecast errors to be serially correlated at the individual and at the aggregate level. Now what that implies that is when we find serial dependence in forecast errors, it's completely silent as by, you know, by itself about the optimality or rationality of individual agents' belief formation. The only way we can actually assess whether or not agents are behaving optimally that is, assess the degree of rationality and belief formation at the individual agent level, is to have a benchmark in which agents' forecast errors are naturally serially dependent, and then we can make judgments about whether or not that dependence departs from what we would think of as optimal behavior. So for that purpose, we need <clears throat> a benchmark learning setting, and here's what I'm going to use for my talk today. So I'm going to assume that yields on an M period zero coupon bond follow a linear factor model, a very common assumption in the empirical literature on bond prices and indeed assumption that's used widely uh, among professional forecasters and indeed on trading desks. I'm going to rotate the factors so that without loss of generality essentially, uh, these are the first three principal components of bond yields. And when you recognize the factor model and the accurate ob observations we have about both bond yields and these latent factors, or observed factors now in this case with rotation, 
The noisy signal friction that's been studied in some of these models is not really a very natural friction, I think, for thinking about learning in bond markets. So let me tell you what I'm going to do instead. I'm going to assume that all agents share the same known pricing distribution for bonds. And so the factor loadings, the A's and the B's in this factor model, are common knowledge to all of the agents. Now we might ask, is that a reasonable assumption given that I have this survey data on professional forecasters? And I'm going to argue the answer is yes. If you look at the lower left here, these are the loadings, the estimates of the B's on the first principal component, one of the factors of the actual surveys of the market participants for the survey forecast. That is, I took the survey forecast, I broke them up into deciles of forecasters, um, averaged them, and regressed the forecast of bond yields onto the forecast of the PCs for these 10 groupings of investors and recovered the, uh, the loadings. And you can see they're virtually identical for both level on the left and slope on the right across all these deciles of forecasters. And in other words, there's a lot of structure to the beliefs of these professional forecasters. As wildly different as their level forecasts are, they all seem to be believing in the same factor model. So this seems like a reasonable departure. So what are they learning about then? Well, I'm going to assume the risk factors follow a vector auto regression, but one with time-bearing parameters where the parameters are unknown. And I'm going to assume that a Bayesian on econometrician facing this setting is learning about these parameters under the assumption that they have potential of permanent structural change in their evolution over time. That is, that the parameters follow random walks. This is something that we explored in depth in GLS. It's also, interestingly enough, something that Fama looked at in the mid-2000s, where he looked at forward rates and future spot rates and argued that the only way to rationalize the behavior of these two during his sample period was for the parameters that agents were facing to be undergoing permanent structural unforeseen shocks. And that's indeed exactly what I'm assuming here. So then in that case, the, the Bayesian learner's forecast of future bond yields filters through the factor model the forecast of the future PCs, and they're going to be just the estimates from the vector auto regression with the econometricians filtered estimates of the parameters uh, weighting the factors, okay? So that's going to be the benchmark learning model that I'm going to be looking at and having in mind throughout my discussion of the behavior of professional forecasters. So how is disagreement going to be measured? Well, I'm going to be looking at treasury bond yields, zero coupon yields out to 10 years. I'm going to be using the blue chip financial forecasts. Uh, from uh, January 85 up through 2018. And the measure of disagreement I'm going to focus on throughout most of my talk today is the disagreement about the two-year bond over a one-year horizon and the 10-year bond over a one-year horizon. So two different measures of disagreement. Most of the variation in disagreement across forecast horizons and forecasters is captured by the first couple of principal components of disagreement. So having two measures of disagreement goes a long ways towards capturing all of the, co the variation in disagreement. And what does it look like empirically? Well, here are two graphs, the two-year disagreement on the left, the 10-year disagreement on the right. There are about 200, just a little less, forecasters in my sample, 115 from financial institutions, about 50 from consulting firms. If you break up forecasters into different groups, uh, financial institutions in one group, consulting firms in the other, and you look at disagreement within each of those groups, it turns out that the measures of disagreement track pretty closely the measures of disagreement for all forecasters, as you can see from these graphs. So I'm going to be looking at all forecasters throughout the analysis and these two measures of, of disagreement. Now, I mentioned at the outset that disagreement is predictive. That is, the disagreement by these professional forecasters is predictive for future excess returns. Here I have just in-sample projections of excess returns over a one-year horizon on two-year bonds and 10-year bonds. They're highly persistent. They're predictable. You can see that PCs have a lot of predictive power. And disagreements correlated with PCs, those indirectly having predictive power through the PCs. But importantly, disagreement incrementally has forecast 
power for the principal components, as you can see by the statistically significant parameters on the disagreement variables in these regressions and the significant increase in R-squareds by including disagreement. In GLS, we show that this holds up not only within sample, but on an out-of-sample learning basis for real-time learning. So then, given this disagreement, who holds these tail beliefs about bond yields? Are the forecasters that we're measuring, are they persistently thinking that yields are going to be high or yields are going to be low? Or is some other pattern in the data? Well, we can look at that by looking at one year ahead transition. So here's what I do. You take the top 20% of the yield forecasters, those who have the highest yield forecast, and we ask a year from now, where are they? Are they still in the top 20%? Do they fall to the bottom 20%? Do they fit in the middle 60%? Well, if we were randomly distributing this top 20% over the support of the forecast distribution a year from now, we would find 20% in the top, 20% of them fall in the bottom, and about 60% of them move to the middle. And when you look at these graphs, you can see over time that that's pretty much what happens. That is to say, these forecasters are not consistently giving high yield forecasts or consistently giving low yield forecasts. Rather, they're wandering around the support of the distribution of forecasts throughout the sample period. And if they start today in the top 20%, there's a 20% chance a year from now they'll actually be in the bottom 20%. And, and similarly for those in the bottom 20%. So the image we should have is forecasters who are not stuck in one region of the forecast space, but are consistently roaming relative to each other, roaming throughout the support of the forecast distribution. So with that in mind, <clears throat> let's look at how these forecasters actually update forecasts in ways that produce serially correlated forecast errors. So in particular, let's follow the literature and look at how forecast errors, here I'm looking at nine month ahead forecasts, are correlated with re revisions in forecasts nine months ahead by the professional forecasters. So in the classical rational expectation setting, these forecast errors wouldn't have any serial correlation, so the beta Fs would be zero. But here we're expecting to find non-zero betas because the participants are facing informational frictions. And in my benchmark setting, learning is about these unknown factor dynamics, and that will necessarily imply, learning, optimal learning will imply that beta is non-zero. Actually, Bayesian learning gives even a richer model of that. The Bayesian updating will give time-bearing betas in these regressions, but I'm going to look at constant, constant parameters. It's a regression that we can fit, even though a Bayesian might show updating over time. We can run this throughout the sample, and we can estimate this regression for individuals without knowing their learning rules. All we need to know are their forecasts, and we can run these regressions. So let's do that, and let's see what we find. So here are the frequency plots of the betas across the near 200 individual BCFF forecasters. The, obviously, these forecasters not only disagree about where yields are, but they're quite heterogeneous in how they update, how their, their belief formation, how their learning rule translates into serially dependent forecast errors and how their forecast errors are related to revisions in their past expectations. Uh, that's just to say they have different views on how the dynamics of the parameters affecting the, the risk factors or other aspects of the, their learning model are different. The median sits towards the center of gravity there. That's the black vertical line as you go across maturities uh, for the median estimate of these betas on PC1. This is the graph for the reactions of principal components. By the way, I should quickly mention that the literature typically looks at how forecast errors are correlated with revisions and expectations about bond yields. But since yields follow a linear factor model in my setting here, um, why not look separately at revisions of forecasts of the factors, namely PC1 and PC2, and that's what I'm doing. It'll be informative, as we'll see in a minute. Now I'm going to add to this graph what the Bayesian forecaster would have, forming optimal forecast 
over time. And you can see the red dashed line there is the estimate of beta by each maturity for the Bayesian forecaster. And the final black dotted line to the right is the estimate for the consensus forecaster, the forecaster who throughout the sample holds the median level yield forecast on these bonds of different maturities. As you roam across, you see that the Bayesian forecaster has a reaction coefficient that's quite similar to the median, the center of gravity of all these individual forecasters. And the Bayesian is behaving optimally in the sense of following a Bayesian learning rule throughout this time in recognition that they have this informational friction of not knowing the underlying dynamics of the risk factors they have to be looking at. But all in all, the center of gravity of the frequency distribution for these individual forecasters looks pretty Bayesian uh, at this stage. The outlier here, if you look down there at the 10-year yield, seems to be the consensus forecaster. I'm going to say more about that pseudo agent in just a second. But the most striking thing actually perhaps about this picture that I would like you to notice is that if you look at the plot of this frequency distribution, there's a systematic shift to the left as we go out with increasing maturity. That is the whole distribution for the 10 year yield is shifted to the left more negative than the distribution of response coefficients for the six month yield. This is holding fixed the forecast horizon. It's always nine months. We're just changing the maturity of the bond. So why is that? Well, I'm going to come back and spend quite a bit of time talking about that in just a minute. I will say, though, that if you go back to the C and G type framework, where these coefficients, these reaction coefficients, are interpreted in terms of the degree of over or under reaction, or rather kind of somewhat judgmental view of the behavior of these agents, uh, then this would be saying that we have under reaction for six month bond yields in terms of how they respond to, to revisions and expectations and over reaction to their revisions of expectations at the 10 year yield. But again, I want to emphasize there's no notion of under or over reaction here at this stage anyway because a Bayesian who's behaving completely optimally given their informational frictions would have exactly this pattern in the data, that their loadings, their reaction coefficients would become increasingly negative as maturity on the bonds increases. So we'll take a look in a minute as why that's the case. Before that, let me just comment briefly on the loadings on the second principal component, the slope of the yield curve. Well, here, they don't shift over time with maturity. And here, once again, particularly for the 10-year, we see that the consensus forecaster, the one holding median views, is somewhat anomalous relative to the center of gravity of the individual forecasters and also relative to the Bayesian learner. So the, the, the consensus forecaster is this confounding of many individual forecasters because people are roaming around the support of the distribution of forecasts relative to each other throughout the sample. So what we found in GLS was this consensus forecaster substantially out underperformed, substantially underperformed the Bayesian econometrician, had much worse forecasts. So we have this construct that we often put into our theoretical models or use to evaluate or calibrate our theoretical models that is actually this kind of mongrel agent with really bad forecasting performance, not only relative to the Bayesian, but also relative to the center of gravity of the individual forecasters. And we know from theory, it's not really the representative agent we'd want to be looking at because we would want uh, wealth weighted aver uh, averages of the views of these individuals, not just a simple median or mean. So it's a little treacherous is what this data is showing uh, to use that median forecaster and think of them as a consensus agent. They're really a rather anomalous uh, agglomeration of all of these individual forecasters. So back to the question about these P first loadings on PC1 forecast revisions. Why does the frequency distribution shift to the left? To look at this, let's think about the classic decomposition of bond yields into the average of expected future short rates and a term premium, a decomposition that's just been widely studied for decades in the term structure literature. And let's recognize that the forecast errors of the variable on the left-hand side, the bond yield, 
can be decomposed into forecast errors of this expectations piece. That is revision, how, how your, your error in forecasting your future average expected future short rates or your error in forecasting your future term premium. Now from the term structure literature, we know that short-term bond variation is primarily driven from variation in expected future short rates relative to the term premium. On the other hand, for long-term bond yields, shocks to the term premium are more important for generating variation in yields than shocks to expected future short rates. So that'll play a role in what we're going to find in a minute. And this decomposition at the bottom of the slide is purely tautological. We give content to it by using a model of expectations formation. And here I'm going to use this Bayesian learning model to generate the forecast of yields over all future horizons. I can't do this for the individual forecasters because they only go out one year and I'm going to need forecasts over a horizon of 10 years to look at this decomposition for bonds. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm going to take these individual components, these forecast errors, and I'm going to project them onto the forecast revisions of PC1 and PC2 um, of my Bayesian learner. And what you see in the first column reading down is you see the loadings, the betas that we talked about a minute ago for the, the Bayesian econometrician. Here starting at one year and going down to 10 year, you'll notice again they start positive, that's just the betas I talked about earlier in the graphs, they turn negative, they become increasingly negative with maturity. Where is that coming from? Is that coming from the expectations piece, the term premium piece, or both? Well, if you look at the last column, you see that in these projections, it's coming virtually entirely from the term premium piece. The forecast errors of the term premium are negatively related to revisions and forecasts PC1 as a direct consequence, again, of Bayesian learning. And that becomes increasingly negative as you go out to bonds of longer maturities. Now, bonds of longer maturities, the term premium component's more important than the expectations piece, and these weights are becoming increasingly negative. So mechanically, that's what's driving that behavior. It's a natural consequence of long-term bond yields having much greater weight on term premium variation than expectations variation than short-term bonds. But let's dig a little bit more deeply into this decomposition. And let's take a look at the one-year bond yield. So I'm going to take the forecast errors of, the, of this Bayesian econometrician over a one-year, uh, over a nine-month period on the one-year bond yield, and I'm going to project the forecast errors onto the first three principal components. These are the fitted values from the projections, the blue line in this graph, the green bars down there are the NBER recessions. Okay, so this is the predictable component of the forecast errors, predicting with the PCs. And what you see right away are the forecast errors move systematically over time, and they're very pro-cyclical. The other line on here is the same fitted projection errors, forecast errors, of the Bayesian econometrician, it's for now, and now I'm going to add in as forecasters historical disagreement among the individual forecasters. And what you see is the red line moves even more dramatically, swings more widely than the blue line. That is to say that there's even greater predictable persistence in these forecast errors when I condition on disagreement. Now, the Bayesian who's learning is learning only from the principal components. And what I'm finding is if I bring in extra information, namely information about disagreement, that those forecasts by that Bayesian econometrician are suboptimal in the sense there's a lot of predictability of their forecast errors using disagreement. This is just confirmation, again, through the lens of this Bayesian learner that the disagreement up by the individual professional survey forecasters has a lot of information about actual realized excess returns and bond yields in the market. And so I get much higher predictability. So let's take this, decomp this, this uh, predictable component in the one-year forecast errors and let's decompose it into its two pieces. On the lower left is the piece associated with 
the, the, the persistent forecast errors in the expectations component of bond yields. On the right is the term premium piece. As I mentioned earlier, the expectations piece is much more important in terms of yield dynamics at the lower, shorter end of the yield curve. And you can see the predictable components of forecast errors for the one year are much more highly associated with the component, the predictable piece of the expectations piece versus the term, versus the term premium piece. But even more interesting here in this diagram, when I bring in disagreement, which I know improves my forecasts of the forecast errors by my Bayesian econometrician, that extra information is being channeled almost 100% through the predictability of the expectational error. That is, disagreement seems to be very informative about how people update their beliefs about their expected average future short rates, much more so in this setting anyway, than how they update their beliefs about the term premium. And an interesting question for future research is what aspects of our economic models would give rise to this pattern? Now you might wonder, given that the term premium is a relatively small component of this one year yield and of these forecast errors, maybe this is somewhat specific to the short end of the curve. Well, let's look at the long bond yield. Here's the 10-year yield. Again, forecast errors over a nine-month horizon. Interestingly, the forecast, the predictable piece of the forecast errors here is much smaller than at the short end of the yield curve. Um, but when we look at the decomposition on the lower two graphs, the left being the expectations piece, the right being the term premium piece, we see that they cycle much more dramatically, both of them, the term premium piece now being sizable and important as a predictable component, as a component of the predictable behavior of the forecast errors on the 10-year bond. They're both much larger than the actual predictable component, and the reason that's possible is because they're negatively correlated. So once again, though, we see that disagreement is informative primarily, not entirely, but primarily about revisions and expectations about the expectations piece of the bond yield. That is, disagreement informs us about the errors that a Bayesian learner is making in forecasting their future views about the average future short rates, and not so much related to the term premium. This is actually seems to be a quite robust feature of learning, and it's actually true in the actual professional survey data at the short end of the curve, where I can compute uh, corresponding pictures. This pro-cyclical pattern here is really quite intuitive. If you have to learn about the underlying yield dynamics and you have a confounding of whether it's shocks to the movement, the level or slope of the yield curve that are driving a behavior of yields, or it's the parameters governing their dynamics that are changing. As you're gathering new data, you're constantly filtering and trying to make a judgment about the relative importance of the two of them. As we approach an economic downturn, it seems quite natural that our forecast of our future views on average future short rates are going to uh, be relatively um, high compared to our actual beliefs six months or nine months in the future where we have a lot more information and we're going to see negative forecast errors as we approach a recession. On the other hand, coming out of recessions, what's going to happen is rates have been low. Are they going to rise? How quickly are they going to rise? We're not sure. And we're going to form forecasts facing this confounding of signals about whether it's shocks or changes in parameters that we're facing. We form for our best guess today of what we think is going to happen in nine months. But when nine months rolls around later and we look at our actual expected future average of expected short rates, we'll have a lot more information to think about. And we will tend to, therefore, ad adjust upward. And our forecast errors are going to be systematically positive. We will be under forecasting what we're going to believe in the future. And that's exactly what comes out of this systematically, what comes out of this Bayesian learning rule. Again, I want to emphasize as the optimal behavior of this Bayesian con econometrician, given the assumptions about the underlying environment and their learning rule. Okay, so 
Back to the individual forecasters. We see this disagreement, we see this systematic behavior, we see that forecast errors are predictable. Yield disagreement is highly informative about that predictability and the nature of that predictability over time. To what extent is this driven by macroeconomic considerations? In particular, to what extent is it driven by disagreement about underlying macro fundamentals? So for example, if I happen to believe rates are going to be high in the future, do I also think inflation is going to be high or economic growth is going to be high? Because that would mean that these fundamentals are informing and driving my disagreement about bond yields. And if it's not macro fundamentals that's driving disagreement in bond markets, then what is driving it? Okay, so let's take a look at that first question. I'm gonna take the, the forecasters who fall in the top 20% of the yield forecast, and I'm gonna ask, where do they fall in the distribution of macro forecast of inflation and output growth? Well, if they were sort of randomly distributed, then my top 20% of yield forecasters, 20% would fall in the saying inflation's gonna be high, 20% would say it's relatively low, 60% would say it's roughly in the middle. And that's pretty much again what we see in the pictures. We see, if you think about looking across from left to right on these graphs, we have output at the, bot at the top and, and inflation at the bottom. If we look at these graphs, we see that about 20% of the high yield forecasters end up thinking inflation will be high, but about 20% think it's gonna be low, and 60% think it's gonna be in about the middle. That is to say, there's almost no correspondence here at all or connection between their disagreement about yields and their disagreement about the macro economy. Let me show that to you one other way. Let's take the actual forecaster who's at the 90th and at the 10th decile who's defining the yield disagreement at a point in time. And let's go and look at their actual forecasts of inflation, the person at the 90th and the person at the 10th decile, and ask, do they disagree? Or let's ask about real economic growth. Do they disagree? The top left picture shows these agents sorted by their views on the level of the yield curve. The person who thinks the level is going to be high, the person who thinks it's going to be low. And then I go and get their corresponding forecast of economic growth. And what you see in the top left, the black line there, is it cycles around zero. That is to say, those forecasters who have really disparate views about where the level of the interest rates of the yield curve is going to be, have no disagreement at all about what's going to happen to economic growth. And the same is true if I sort these agents on their views on the slope of the yield curve, which are the right side of this diagram. Now, when I look at inflation, which is the lower left diagram, where I'm sorting on the level of the yield curve, in the early part of the sample, it does appear there's a little bit of correspondence between the agents who think we're going to have very disparate, who have very disparate views about the level of the curve and those who have disparate views about inflation. That's we've just come off that period of high inflation and the disinflation. But after the dot-com bust, that just goes away pretty much. And again, there's no correspondence about disagreement about inflation and disagreement. Uh, and the actual disagreement, which is the blue line that we see in the data. So whatever is driving yield disagreement is not that of disagreement about inflation or output growth. Very much consistent with uh, what GLS found in that the learning agent conditions on yield disagreement and finds it completely uninformative to condition on macro disagreement in forecasting future bond yields. So what's missing from our equilibrium models? Well, we could of course think much more broadly about the macro economy so for instance, uh, we might have disagreement about fiscal policy and its impact on bar markets. And indeed, there is a lot of evidence that fiscal policy has an impact on, on, on risk premiums in bond markets. The supply of debt has an impact from Christian Murthy and Missing Jorgensen, for example, on 
the risk premiums in bond markets. There's a lot of literature showing that shocks to fiscal policy uncertainty uh, have a big effect on risk premiums in bond markets. And some of the work in GLS suggests a connection from yield disagreement and, uh, and fiscal policy uncertainty. But we need to look at that, I think, more systematically and see whether or not those agents who are so having such disparate views about interest rates also have differing views about fiscal policy. And for that, we don't have really readily available data from the surveys, but more work along these lines could be done. More broadly, I think we might want to be looking and asking ourselves about whether disparate beliefs about asset demands or supplies, about the deployable or investable capital, somewhat related to slow moving capital, or time variation in the marginal investor underlies this strong predictive power of yield disagreement for bond market risk premiums. I'm actually constantly struck by how much attention financial institutions give to the flows in markets, the supplies and demands, and their forecasts of supplies and demands, when they're assessing where market yields and or prices are going to go and the nature of risk in the markets. And that's very much consistent with these other frictions about supplies and demands and flow of investable capital are with, uh, with, with the story here about why yield disagreement might matter. That's not in most of our theory, and I think a lot more attention to this might be useful given this weak tie to macro. There's a really nice paper by Heyerdahl and Illidich that looks at these issues where they develop an equilibrium model with differing beliefs about future asset demands, and this is, arises even though economic fundamentals are known, and one of the consequences of this model is that it perfectly replicates this empirical evidence that yield disagreement seems to have no strong connection whatsoever to disagreement about macro fundamentals, at least those for which we have data and I've looked at. Okay, well let me end with a question that I asked at the very beginning, and you might have noticed by now that I haven't really completely answered. Do I think the BCFF professionals are indeed rational forecasters? That is, are they optimally using all available information in building their forecasts? And even though their forecast errors are serially correlated, are the patterns of serial dependence such that we would think that they are being optimal or efficient in their updating of beliefs? Well, let's take a look at that. We looked at this regression of forecast errors under revisions of forecasts, and we found that the betas on the forecast revisions of the factors of the principal components looked pretty much like, at least towards the center of gravity of the distribution, I haven't gone way away from that median, but in the center of gravity of the distribution of these professional forecasters was pretty much the same as what a Bayesian econometrician would have found using the same historical data over the same time period and optimally building forecasts using a Bayesian learning rule in the presence of shifting parameters. But throughout this discussion, I ignored the intercept. I ignored the beta naught. And when we look at the distribution of the empirical estimates of beta naught in these regressions, we actually see a quite strikingly different picture than the betas on the risk factors, on the revisions of expectations. First of all, it's bimodal. And this is something that I want to look more into. There seem to be kind of two groups of, of forecasters as to where their betas lie. The median lies right in the middle of these two modes, and the consensus forecaster is right there with the median. On the other hand, this is all for the two-year yield, but the pictures look pretty similar for other maturities. The Bayesian learner has an intercept that's much, much closer to zero. This suggests that there may be systematic negative bias in the BCF forecasts and forecast errors across all of these professional forecasters. And why might that be happening? Well, let's go back to the factor dynamics. Remember, the principal components by my Bayesian are assumed to be evolving over time with parameters that are unknown and follow a random walk. They experience permanent changes. What that implies is that this Bayesian would always be thinking 
that from the vantage point of today and given the parameters I have today, if I calculated the implied long run mean of the level and slope of the yield curve, that these long run means would be shifting around on me over time. I would be recognizing that the long run means of the level and slope of the yield curve are stochastically moving on me. And in this period, this sample period, we had a very long period of gradually declining interest rates. And so we would have had this period of unexpected structural shifts downward in the long run means of, of the level and of the long, on the, in the level of yields. That's the red line coming here. This is actually a plot from the Bayesian econometrician in GLS of their own views as they're learning in real time about the long run mean of the level of interest rates. That's the red. The blue uh, squiggly line towards the bottom there is the long run mean of the, of the slope of the yield curve. Not surprisingly, it's not drifting very much. So the Bayesian is picking up on this gradual decline of the steady state uh, long run mean of interest rates. Macroeconomists have been looking at this and have been thinking in terms of either long run shifts in the steady state real interest rate during this period or perhaps declining target inflation rates by the Federal Reserve, all of which were unpredictable by the market participants. They were continually being surprised. And there's a quite large literature going back quite a while now in the term structure that argues that if you take into account what they called shifting endpoints, these shifting long run means, you're going to be substantially improving your forecasts of, uh, of interest rates. And our Bayesian is picking up on that and is picking up on something that probably does have macroeconomic roots in terms of the shifts of the long run mean of the level and slope of the yield curve. Now the benchmark learning model helps us interpret this and see why the Bayesian was picking this up. The forecast revisions of a Bayesian in the learning rule that I've written down for this Bayesian actually has three components. It has the forecast errors, and so forecast revisions reflect their forecast errors that they've made because of their learning in the presence of this informational friction. But it also reflects their filtered revisions in both the intercepts and the autoregressive parameters of the dynamics of the risk factors. By taking that into account, by constantly updating their views on the long run means of these state variables, they're trying as best they can to pick up on this dynamics and their forecast errors show very little bias over time. It appears to be the case, on the other hand, that the professional forecasters systematically, um, at least towards the center of gravity of the distribution of these forecasters, are missing this. They're failing to capture this stochastic shifts of these long run means, of these declining either long run uh, target inflations or, uh, or long run real interest rates in the real economy. And as a consequence, they have a systematic negative bias in their forecast, at least towards the center of gravity of the distribution. So an area of future research, I think, and an interesting one that I'll be following up as I continue to develop this paper is what's going on, how do we think about these different groups of investors, and, and then what are the consequences of this for our economic models? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, for your service to the American Finance Association. Your hard work and your perseverance always driving towards a high quality outcome for the benefit of the AFA is exemplary. Thank you very much, Ken. And also congratulations on now being a fellow of the American Finance Association. Thank you, John. It's, it's needless to say been a, a, a tremendous honor to serve. And now I'd like to welcome you as the uh, incoming president of the American Finance Association. We're going to be in wonderful hands and I look forward to continuing to work with you over the coming year. And let me now then symbolically pass to you the, the gavel and, uh, and, uh, and thank you again.
Thank you, Ken. This, the business meeting is hereby closed.